Hi there. Welcome to The Preventable, the podcast giving you a seat at the table with conversations about the intersection of alcohol, drugs, and mental health in everyday lives. Take a seat and join us. Welcome to The Preventable. With me today is a dear friend of mine personally, but also of the organization. And he just so happens to be our board president. Uh, welcome to The Preventable, Mr. Tom Etling. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, you know this, but I'll just say this for those listening, that uh, we couldn't do the podcast today without the support of Hubbard, who allow us to come in, give us the space, help us with all of our technical glitches. I mean, not saying we ever have any, but if we have any. Uh, so we're just really grateful for them, too. Um, so thanks for being here, buddy. Yeah, Hubbard's the best. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Uh, so we have no agenda for this conversation. So we're Perfect. just gonna we're just gonna kind of go all over the place. But first, um, I would like to kind of give your official title, which is husband, dad, yes. sure, son. Mm-hmm. You've led nonprofits for years in this community, and now you've gone out on your own and are a founder and managing partner of this new business called ESP. Yeah. Um. Were you like so pleased with yourself when you came up with this name? You know, it's pretty obvious. Most people, when they ask about the name, they don't even relate that it stands for Etling Strategy Partners, which is kind of cool. They that kinda, is kind of cool. Because it, it's kind of like the purpose is not that it fit, it retrofit like that, but it just kind of naturally happened. So it's uh, it's exciting. We spent a lot of time. Um, like bingo. That's it, it. it. It was pretty cool. And I had some great folks help me kind of develop it. And it's, uh, it's turned out uh, beyond our expectations. So what is ESP? Talk to me yeah. about that. I mean, I know I know what ESP is, but what is Etling Strategy Partners? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. so we've uh, I've been a part of a few agencies and owned one and led another and uh, what we realized is where the gaps were kind of in the in the industry relative to agencies. So there's a lot of creative shops and there's a lot of great digital marketing shops, but there's not a lot of good strategy shops and so it, at its at its kind of essence, ESP is a chief marketing officer strategy and support firm okay so it's four organizations that have a large in-house function that just need another kind of ceo coo cmo side person that can help them make sure everything's tying back to strategy and at the end of the day the organization is accomplishing its broader goals beyond just marketing um and then it's also for organizations that have no no internal marketing or issues management roles and they need ex- expertise that can kind of come in and plug in um, and do project manage- management, and then they can they can plug back out. So you're not bringing on FTEs if you don't need FTEs, right. you know? So this is really, you know, for folks that don't know, this is really where you and I, I mean, we had known each other before I became executive director. Yeah. But then when I became executive director, I knew pretty clearly that we had like a, I'll say a void in terms of marketing and development and we didn't know if we should combine those two if we should keep those separate we were looking for a person to come on and lead the team um really because i trusted your opinions quite frankly then i started leaning on you for just advice and then that transferred into you really acting as our consultant and helping think about this was before this is why we were ncada but really thinking about our brand how we showed up how we told the story of what we did who was on our marketing and communications team whether or not that should be with development um helping me interface with the board on sort of selling certain ideas like it's because of you that we actually have a marketing budget in Mm, right 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 annual budget we hadn't had one of those but that me as as a relatively new executive director i'm like how much do these things cost how much should we be as an organization be spending on marketing because you always think that's one of the like fluffy things right and it is but without the marketing you don't get the dollars or you can't serve the people so it's a necessary component of the business but you started providing consultation you and hannah bailey yeah, were providing right. consultation Absolutely. to us and helped us with the growth of sands bar and positioning that so is that kind of your like is that your niche like are those kinds of projects that i just described are those kind of things that yeah, you're doing now for sure it's a lot of organizations in transition so mm-hmm. it's it's nonprofit, it's higher ed it's healthcare, it's kind of industrial manufacturing we have hosp- food service hospitality yeah. 
uh, attractions clients as well. So it's anywhere where you, like any business, you have a you have a, a need to be intentional with every interaction with your customer. But then on the the business side of it is how do you organize the staffing? How do you organize the services? So we have agency partners all over the place, and agency partners are brilliant in their own right, but inherently not great at working together. Mm. So you just kind of put them all in a room and you figure out what's best for the client and you kind of see who who still sticks around in the room, right? And sometimes less is more, right? So um, you don't need to spend more. You just got to be smarter a lot of times. And I learned that on the agency side where it's like a lot of times we'll just recommend put more money at it or spend more. And at the end of the day, it's just thinking differently and figuring out, again, be, being just so smart about and, and so intentional about what the client and the client's customer needs versus what we need as an organization. And we'll, we'll win if, the, if they'll win every time. So you and Susan Weissman were critical when we were faced with a crossroads of needing to change our name. Now, we had toyed around with the idea. I mean, Howard had certainly toyed around with the idea. Previous executive directors had toyed around with the idea. Like, sorry, I have this like weird hair that's like, <laughs> driving me crazy and I can't seem to find it. Anyway. The dog? Uh, yeah. No, I think it's one of mine, actually. <laughs> I think it's a sign of getting older and just profusively shedding. Got it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we never really liked our name the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse, you know, NCADA. It's a bunch of letters. What does it mean? We were national, but we weren't really national. Yep. We were never really a council. Alcoholism and drug abuse, you couldn't really say, at least you can't say them now, and you really were starting not to be able to say them in 2019. Um, I think the worst was when I was introduced as uh, the executive director of the NAACP. Yeah. And I was like, hmm, yeah, that's not it. Not it. Uh, I've also been introduced as Nicole from the NCAA. Really? I wish that that was (laughs) it. You wish that was it, yeah. Because I don't don't sport. That would be cool. Yeah, that would be cool. But then going into a classroom and saying, hey, I'm Nicole and I'm from the NCADA. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's the National Council on Alcoholism Drug Abuse. (gasps) You're here to talk about drugs? Like, first graders can't deal with that information. So then Howard had the brilliant idea that I still give him shit about, which is, oh, we'll just go by our initials, NCADA. So we'll be like CVS. I'm like, good luck telling a third grader <laughs> when they say, what does NCADA stand for? And you're like, nothing. Right. Like, good luck with that. But then we really hit this point in 2019 where we were faced with, like, we, we had to change our name um, because some things had gone on with the national affiliate and we just needed, it was a really good reset time. You, I think, were one of my first calls, like after, because you were not affiliated with the board at that time. Mm. So after we talked at the board that we needed to do it, I think I called you and Susan like next and said, and how, yep. and how. So you became a really vital portion of that, helping us find the firm that ultimately helped us. And that's Angie and her firm with Almanac at the time. But I'm wondering if you could just kind of like talk through And I joked with ESP, but I'm wondering if you could just kind of talk through like how important a name is, but more than a name, like a brand identity, because you have really helped us formulate our brand identity. Could you talk about how that's important for people who might be like, eh? Well, I think in the nonprofit space, it's even more important because Mm -hmm. you you are going to have less budget than for profits most of the time yeah, regardless just, and, and right. you have a higher responsibility with those dollars i think in 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 your space to use them even more wisely a lot of times than than for profit so i at the end of the day the brand really is every touch point though so the brand is built on the people you know, the only reason there's a brand promise is the people and the work that you do every day so you could you could be the the coolest flashiest most well marketed organization in the world but if you don't really deliver that promise and that's what prevent that does so well right so you you convene you're intentional you're intimate you're one on one you listen you're present all those that's what the brand is and so i think a big objective of when we changed the name or recommended that you change the name was one of few i would say one of few versus one of many mm-hmm. there is so much clutter in the nonprofit space and all well-intentioned for the most part organizations that are doing great work, but you can relate to the kaleidoscope of organizations. 28,000, I think, right. in this region. And how many are called hope or faith or grace or love or and all great words in and of themselves, but at the end of the day, you have a limited opportunity to touch your, your consumer. I still remember I uh, I had back surgery 10 years ago and I was at, at, at uh, Mercy Hospital and I told my direct I was running a nonprofit at the time, St. Patrick's Center, and I told my director of communications, no one knows who we are. 
and we were in the center of volunteer St. Louis philanthropy and volunteerism for those of you who are in St. Louis in St. Louis County on Ballas and Highway 40. I mean, a lot of resources come from that area, a lot of churches and Absolutely. and volunteers. So of the 10 people, I started doing my research at 4:30 in the morning. Yeah, you're doing your focus group. So I was nervous right. and I was going into to the Welcome Center, the intake center and I uh from that person on through the person that delivered communion to me, my third day in the hospital, eight out of 10 had never heard of St. Patrick's Center. And for those of those listening that aren't in St. Louis, it is one of the most well-known yeah, right. it's organizations organization. of any profit or yeah. nonprofit. And so eight didn't, seven, actually seven had never heard of us. Two had heard that we did something related to the homeless, but the community struggling with homelessness. Right. And only one person, the person that delivered communion to me was the one that said, oh, by the way, here's what you do. And it was housing, employment, behavioral health, serve oh, night. Wow. I mean, really was deep into it. So I think that's the importance of a big importance of the Prevent That brand is if you can't initially make that connection and have and, and something resonates or something is taken, like you said, with students, if they hear NCADA and they just think it's another government thing or something that mm-hmm. they have no idea what it is, or if you alienate right off the tip, right. if you alienate your audience right off the tip, you've lost. So that's what I think you did so well with the brand and you invested in it. I mean- it costs money. Yeah. It's okay to re- it's okay to spend responsibly, but also spend and have resources and be responsible to know that marketing, communications, external affairs are important parts. And that's where you really were a visionary in this regard, because most nonprofits don't understand that. When you started, you know, looking at opportunities to influence legislation in Jeff City, Prevent That was ahead of the curve on that. And even even in Washington, when you ran a Super Bowl ad years ago, I mean, those were things that no nonprofit considered. I, I use Stanford as the example a lot, and Stanford's been through its issues the last few years with COVID and like mm-hmm. every university, and like every college and university, right? right. And that conference has struggled, obviously, but. Stanford won the Director's Cup, which is basically the most successful athletic program in the United States. They won it like 18 out of 20 years. Mm-hmm. And so, as you know, with Charity Navigator and these other these other tools that are good tools to understand kind of if organizations are worth investing in and yeah. how they use resources, what is it? So the 90, 90, 10, or maybe 90% go into programs, 10 into admin. Stanford University was like 60, 40. And they got a lot of scrutiny as to why. And you could argue in retrospect, maybe they needed to do some tweaking, but they ran the best. So if you're running, if you're creating a new model for what's the best, and I think that's back to what we do at ESP is we help you figure out what is the best model, not what's been done before, not what maybe an agency has recommended before, not what maybe even your staff think is the best. Because if you don't see other examples and break out of what you see every day, you're not going to know what else is out there. And so that's I think Prevented does that with what you do and the services you look to offer and grow. And that's kind of the, the, the jam that we have at ESP is thinking differently and getting there faster. Well, so I know I've shared with you and some of the other board members, and you know, thank you for giving me the credit, and I'm going to bounce it right back because I think one thing that one, my mentor, Harry Coppolo, would never take a compliment, but she would say, I have great taste in people, and I surround myself with really smart people. And so I feel that way too, right? And so having you and Angie Winchell and, um, you, you know, all these other amazing people, both externally, but also internally, like Max Deer, you know, like really helping like drive the brand and really focusing in on what the brand is and what it's not. You know, there's a lot of conversation and I've shared with you all at, at the board level about this new sort of movement in nonprofit to sort of not be seen as like a charity that it's okay to your point about stanford it's okay to spend money on your staff on the building on the um, team environment to help the team really feel like they're part of something Um, if we are not paying living wages to the people that are on our team then we're basically making them become our clients right And um, there's lots of movement around this with TED Talks and documentaries called Uncharitable and things like that. And I think that you in particular have really helped me, but also other nonprofits understand that it is important to invest in marketing and communication. It's important to be treated. And I said this to you very early on, like, I know we're a nonprofit. Do not treat me like a nonprofit. Yep, right. Do not. Uh, cool. If you want to give me like a little bit of a like a discounted rate. But I want your attention just as much as your for-profit clients want. And I want your brain power as much as you give your for-profit clients. I think that's only fair. And um, 
because we have a smaller budget, I think, and this could be my bias, I think it sort of means more to us because it's not a rounding error. Like it actually means something. And maybe that means we're more apt to listen to what you say. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. But I do, I love that you are continuing in ESP to continue to focus on nonprofits because I think that sometimes we get these like run of the mill people that kind of give us like shitty advice right. and right. or advice on how to cut corners when if you can't get the brand out there and if people don't think, oh, prevent ed, mental health and substance use disorders, kids, conversations, okay, then you're missing an opportunity. Well, and there's a lot of similarities between your world and higher education. I mean, I've mm, two boards, one board that I served on and another client of mine have both gone out, they're small private universities, have both gone out of business in the last mm -hmm. year. So at the end of the day, if you can't figure out why you're unique yeah. You can't figure out how to run the business and run it. That's the other thing that I think Prevent that does well. You have to run, you have a, it's a business that you don't need to profit, like maybe the expectation of shareholders in a for profit business, but you have to be able to save because you need to be able to grow. You have to have vision. But at the end of the day, you have clients. It's not like Target. If I go to Target and they don't have my soap, I'm going to be just fine. Your clients, you have a, right. and you have a necessary purpose to be there every day, which is very difficult. It's funny, they always give nonprofits the hardest of tasks. Mm -hmm. We talk about this all the time, right? The most complicated of tasks and the least amount of resources. And I always say about government is government gives you a funding source for three years or whatever the, the time is. And this, I, I really dislike this a lot. You develop a great product, okay? And then you bring the product to market and in the world of prevented, you have a lot of need for this product. Then government says, well, you're pretty good at that now. Let's move that funding source to somebody else, which <laughs> maybe from 35,000 feet makes a lot of sense, but you, there's not much of a retail component coming from the client. So then you have to go find another funding source. It is counterintuitive to, to, to business, really, where you develop a product, put it on the shelf, and oh, by the way, no one's going to pay anything for it. Mm. So it's just, it makes the, the challenge. I don't want to make it more daunting here than it, than it is for you, but um, it, it requires consistency and discipline, but also vision, which is another reason why I'm proud to be on the prevent that board i didn't pay you to say that nope um but speaking of paying so this is a yes or no question if somebody's listening and they're like hmm i need esp to help me do you all have the bandwidth to take on more clients sure but i'll uh, i'm gonna stop the interview if we start selling me too no. much but it's a uh, etling yeah yeah they do etlingpartners.com they okay. can learn everything they need but, but so uh, you have the bandwidth sure we okay. have we're growing and uh, it's it's great and we're not uh it's fun. We're look, we're in Indianapolis and Milwaukee and really growing the footprint of the firm. And uh, it's exciting stuff, but uh, enough about me. Uh, so Tom is about, likes talking about himself as, about as much as I do. Um, so you're a Jesuit, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Segway. That's good. Yeah, That's right? good. That makes I sense. Know. That's that a natural. Makes sense. Right. Yes, ma'am. So is that how you got into nonprofit world or like, because you went no. to SLU High. Right? I did. Okay, so, got, so did that instill within you, like, the servant heart and all that stuff? We just alienated, like, two-thirds of our St. Louis uh, folks. Hopefully this will go out of market it's well. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. I, it's, a, it's a story that I actually I, I don't think I've ever told uh, publicly, but I went into nonprofit because my father. Mm -hmm. And my father was the board chair of St. Patrick's Center for um, years. and he, Shut up. I did not know he this. He was on the board for 15 years, and he worked with Colonel Quinn, with Mike Quinn, who pretty well-known St. Yeah. Louis, and to uh, raise the uh, capital money after Sverdrup back in the day gave them that 100,000-square-foot building on Tucker that they needed to create a full-service um, center, kind of like maybe Del Mar Divine before yeah. it was a Del Mar Divine without the housing component. And uh, then my father got a call, and uh, was he, he the executive director, or he was on the no, board? he was the or? he was on the he was on the board. He was, he was the, board the board chair. Yeah, so 15 wow. years on the board, and then he was co-chairing the capital campaign and he got sick and he was 57 years old I guess and he had a got a glioblastoma and they said he's got three months to live and so I also think it speaks to why you know in science it's not just science and he said okay I don't really I don't really buy that and he lived for almost three years and wow. at the time you know if anybody knows anything about glioblastomas they're really the yeah. kind of the worst of the worst in terms of cancer and so I uh it was interesting. I went into nonprofit then, not directly to St. Patrick Center, but I um, worked in a large nonprofit role for a, the Bi State Development Agency, a large economic development agency, and uh, I had a leadership role there. And then I just, it was strange. I had a five month recruitment process 
to be the CEO of St. Patrick's Center. I always knew I wanted to go back into private business, by the way, so I went back and worked in the agency world after after the St. Patrick's Center role, which was the goal mm-hmm. the whole time with, with Susan mm-hmm. Susan Weissman um, as she was looking to retire. But um, And I had an amazing board. I mean, you're only as good as your board in nonprofits. And I had a board of people that were out put up against any corporate board in the country. I say it all the time, from Jim Cavanaugh of Worldwide Technology to Joe Ambrose to Susan Lombardo to Joe Castellano to Jim Del Carmen um, and Craig Unruh. I, I'm leaving many people out, but I got to do Patrick Quinn. It was an incredible board, and uh, it allowed me to really kind of understand also be in touch with people that that need a need a, a voice. And so that's what I loved about it the most was I was able to, through this organization and a large organization, 160, 70 employees, help people who are at their lowest point have a voice and uh, be able to be heard and have an opportunity to improve their lives and and, and to, like you do so well, just to change the – the, the misconceptions about people that are that are in need. Um, mm-hmm. When I used to give speeches like once a day, like you or twice a day, I would say if anyone's never dealt with physical illness, mental illness, um, divorce, or unemployment, please stand up. Okay, we're all about two steps away from being in a situation right. that a lot of the clients are at St. Patrick's Center. And, and the other thing we always say all the time is it's not a black issue, a white issue, a mm-hmm. blue issue, a gray issue. It doesn't come from North City. It does. It's not like it it's not a comes Republican from issue. It's not a Democrat. It doesn't issue. come it's from South exactly. way South. It they're just people, man. And so at the end of the day, it's our responsibility to help people who have great need and who have who have great barriers. Mm-hmm. Now there's a group of folks who need a little encouragement to move forward and work through their stuff and then become more productive people in society and more productive fathers and mothers. And that's important. But there are people kind of duly diagnosed folks who are in tough places that aren't necessarily going to be in a completely different place. And so that I think that is the role of government. And I think it's the role of kind of private giving to really help the folks like you serve every day who need understanding, who need a, a step forward, who need just a better education as to what they're dealing with and the tools to deal with maybe things in their life that are that are challenging because we all deal with those, you know, those things in life that seem like they're impossible yeah. to, to conquer. You know, or to overcome. Your first day at St. Patrick's Center, did you just like feel your the spirit of your dad? It was bizarre. It I, was. I can't even imagine. But it was. You know, we talked about this. It's like five years. That's where I learned that I think running a large nonprofit and doing it well, it's a five year, it's a five year deal if you're all in. Because St. Pat, I mean, that's it's a big organization. What's the budget? It's a or ish. It's, yeah, it's an eighteen or so yeah, million I mean, dollar a, organization. A big, about that's thirty. A big boy of about thirty all in. But when you're, you know, my head, my dad looking over my shoulder every day, and that sounded great. But it was oh, the, pressure the pressure to do everything right was interesting. But uh, you know, I but I had so many good people there that supported us, and it was uh, all you can do with anything is leave it better than when you got there. And we definitely did that, and we. We built a restaurant and did things that I never had done before, and uh, it's uh, it was the best, but the hardest, you know, four and a half years of, of my career, and uh, I wouldn't, I would never do it again, but uh, <laughs> but I would never trade it, never trade it. I think one of the things that I really like about you, and that I appreciate you, besides the fact that we're, you know, you're my brother from another mother, but um, <laughs> yes, I like the emphasis that you and your wife, but I know you better really place on education and sure. that means prioritizing education not only for your kids but also other people's kids through your involvement with higher ed through your involvement with um just other initiatives and you from what i know about you you seem like you're always on a path to get as educated as possible about whatever that subject is right and you say you're like a pretty lucky person who just kind of falls into things, but mm. we both know that's not true and that you work very hard, mm. but that you prioritize education. Has that always been that for you? Was that something that your parents instilled and like your family was like, like education is paramount, whatever that looks like. Yeah. And then that's something you're passing down. I was big in my house. I mean, my wife was a, a stud student. I was a very average student, and I didn't really enjoy being. I can see you being an average. student. Yeah, thank you. Way. Appreciate You're that. Welcome. I really didn't enjoy You're being welcome. in class. So I learned a couple things. <laughs> One, I was going to have to out hustle people. I was going to have to out research people. Um, I was always taught that you better treat people as well or better than you treat you better. That is that was very good at relationships. Oh, well, I'm just so saying that that was if the not like. A plus on that's like the, right. the one side of the report card, like right. the 
the relationships, the trust, the all of that stuff, like you like knock that stuff. Well, and you got to you just got to surround yourself with good people, and you got to understand what you're where you're good and where you need folks to help, and that's how you build a business. That's how you build a nonprofit. That's how you build a family. Mm -hmm. I mean, your families you got different skills and different abilities to work through different things, and you all come together and you do it as a team. So I I would say education was always very important, and we my parents were we were very fortunate to get the resources we needed to to do that. Um, and, and I'd say my wife, who's much more of an academic than me would tell you that that's a, a massive, was a massive focus for her and she did it as well as anybody. So it's, yeah, you know, and you have good kids and you get a little lucky, right? So we're very, well, very blessed. You have kids who don't always have to be good, but you have kids <laughs> and then you support them. They're mostly good. That, so. Yeah. Right, right. Exactly. Uh, I say that if you're listening, Tom's children, because we don't talk about kids as being good or bad. They just, you know, they're just they're, kids, yeah. right? They're All God's kids. children, as we say, All not God's to get to, yeah. All God's children. Right. <laughs> yeah, sure. That is really funny. Um, so I am just curious about, and I hope we can talk about this because I didn't ask your permission. Tell me about Eisenhower Fellow. What is that? It sounds very fancy, and you're going to tell me it's not fancy, but everybody I know who is an Eisenhower Fellow Seems very fancy. So I am not fancy. Um, well, but what is it? It well, sounds very cool, Tom. So. Um, and how did you get to be an Eisenhower fellow? This is like this is. We don't have time for all of this, but I, what I'll tell you is that President Eisenhower was given a gift, and this Eisenhower fellowships was created years ago. And the whole goal of it was to create. I'm going to butcher the mission statement, but to create more dialogue and better understanding among people, among nations. In Which it. seems like his M.O., because wasn't Eisenhower the guy that created interstates so, and, like, just more communication and yeah. transparency and collaboration well, and all the things, right? And for me, that was always, like, kind of what I was okay at, and that was bringing diverse groups Keep and people together. together and creating strategy around it and moving somewhat, you know, puzzle pieces that didn't seem like they fit together and putting them together and kind of thinking differently. So for me, it was great, but I was kind of a later in my career. I was just under the, it's kind of a mid-career fellowship. And basically I went to, um, I went to Spain and I studied the legacy of the 92 Olympics in Barcelona and its impact on Barcelona and Malaga and Bilbao. Um, and, uh, and it was a great. And then, and then the idea then is that you come back to your city and you and bring, bring those, those lessons learned. Yeah, and then we also studied how um, when big events or big initiatives or big economic development comes to a region, how the region treats folks who might be in underserved communities. And so what so where is the during your St. Patrick's Center? This is a transition this... from St. Patrick's Center CEO to uh, running and joining Dovetail. Interesting. Dovetail. Yeah, so oh, it was okay. uh, we so flexed it, like it a little bit. Yeah. Taking everything you learned from your first place where you were doing um, development like uh what was it what was the first thing you by state or no, yeah well, it was more actually st patrick center okay, like so it's through, kind of like back to private agency right. world so it's yeah kind of like all of that and then figuring out like how that impacts the region but then also pulling in other people who might historically be underserved or ignored yeah. or whatever so we so we spent time with kind of industrial folks and business folks and sports and entertainment leads and you know, civic people and folks running nonprofits and kind of put all those things together to understand kind of the relationship between Madrid and Barcelona and then Malaga. Malaga went You're from, to say I know, I don't want to, yeah, I know, Buffalo I should have. Mar Malaga, Malaga went from kind of this beach and golf city to a thriving, thriving international airport and economic development hub in, in, in southern Spain. Incredible. And you know what they did? It's go back to brands. So Picasso is actually from Malaga. And so everyone, claims Picasso, okay. right? And everyone has a Picasso museum or Picasso sure. exhibit, but they realized, wait a second, guys, we actually he's actually from here. And mm -hmm. so they went all in and created this arts and entertainment and oh, museum cool. district, and Very that was smart. the first museum. And then they did a museum of modern art that is spectacular. And then they did the Thyssen Museum. And then they, so they, they took the historical aspects of the brand and then they applied it to develop, you know, new economic development. And now it's a, it's a thriving and they have a huge business and you know entrepreneurial area of that so community. So you learn all these things, and what do you do? You come back here and you give a PowerPoint presentation. I had to, I, I did <laughs> have. What does that look I, like? I, I did have to do that. Um, Talk and about nerve wracking. Jeez. It, it was yeah that interview process um, with the people in the room. I won't name all of them, but it was a, the most nervous I've been in I my. I can't even imagine in my life. But uh, I, I will tell you one thing though. One of the other fellows, there were nine fellows in my class from the United States, and one was Stephanie McMahon, who was the chief marketing officer 
of the WWE. WWE. Right, right. Which I'm not a. Oh, I'm not I a, am. I'm not a wrestler. Oh right. Gosh. It was crazy. It was crazy. So I. So I'm like at least of these nine. Okay, I got there's a is a, a wrestling. But there's a wrestling executive. I'm like okay, at least I got. You know, I'll be able to be on par there. She was brilliant, brilliant and smart and wonderful. And so to, I left. I called my wife. I said I am definitely like the. They must have gotten my dad's and my name mixed up. Why am I in this class of brilliant? I mean, they were really brilliant people. Wow. And so it was, uh, I wear this Connor's Cure, this bracelet, by the way, because of Stephanie McMahon. It's for a little kid. His name was Connor, and he was dying of brain cancer. And his, his make-a-wish was to go in the ring and be a wrestler. Stop so it. Connor the Crusher. So I use this with our corporate social responsibility clients all the time. I say, I'm not a wrestling fan. So imagine if you really want to oh, unlock right. your brand. I don't like professional wrestling. I love Stephanie Shame McMahon, and I love right, and I love what they did for this kid. That's awesome. They've raised millions and millions for Pittsburgh Pediatric Hospital, oh, and I cool. wear this and talk about it all the time. And I'm not even a consumer and you're not of the even brand. A wrestler fan. Not you're, even a consumer you're not of the at, brand. You know, Monday right. Night Raw. Yeah, right. Shame on you, yeah. by the way. Thank you. So there's but, a lot of great folks in no, St. Louis who are perfect sense. That's like a really great way, I think, to just like that. That to me, that bracelet encapsulates you because I've always seen you wear the bracelet never really start yeah. to ask you what it means yeah. i knew it meant something to you but that's a great example to give to other nonprofits and other companies to say like look at how much they made me care yeah about this. give it a voice and then put strategy around it and it's okay to say you're making more money and because you make more money and more can go to organizations that need it as long as you're true to that kind of whatever you want to call it corporate social responsibility little esg positioning as long as you're authentic with it and you, you actually do what you say you're going to do Everything will tell you it's great for the community, it's great for employees, it's great for retention, it's great for hiring. Um, it, it, doing good things and supporting good organizations is is actually profitable as well as what we're here for. I have to say that you know, not everybody was an Uber fan over the name change. We knew we were never going to make everyone happy. Yep. I also do feel hands down that the brand now is something that staff are jazzed about, which then shows up. Three, you know, tenfold in community. I think that our longtime community partners, it make made total sense to them. Um, I think the brand identity that we've been able to to form and really live into, um, and now we have great stewards on the team that are like, nope, this is this is who we are. That's not what we're gonna do. This is what we're gonna do, and this is how we're gonna talk about things. It's been a game changer, Tom. It's it's been a game changer, and so um, just really want to say thank you for helping us helping guide us through that process and now as board president really helping us live into that because um, it's one thing to just have a really cool name right it's another thing to actually be able to live into it because ultimately then we can serve more people make a name for ourselves so that when people are up against the wall they know who they can call absolutely right? so yep. so i do I, I know you're a very humble man but i do just want to say thank you for helping us live into the brand and understand why identity and strategy around marketing and communications is so damn important. Yeah, so, I appreciate that. You. And you got great people and it's a great, it's a great brand and, uh, and people need, need the service and they need more of it. So the community needs to provide more resources to organizations like prevent that. It's just fundamental. So thank you. All right. I'll stop kissing your butt, even though technically you're like my boss. So, <laughs> yeah, right. um, I could probably should do this all day. <laughs> um, Thank you so much for yeah, great coming to see on, for talking about yourself, which I know is like your least favorite thing to do, but really just thank you for um, for giving a little bit of insight into what you're doing now and why branding and marketing is so important. I would encourage people, I know this is not an ESP commercial, but if you want help like thinking about how to take your brand to the next level, I don't know anyone better, so I would suggest reaching out to Tom. Please tell him that you heard it about the on the preventable. Um, if you like what you're hearing, as always, please consider rating, reviewing, or subscribing. Thank you. For Great being to here. see you. You're the best. Thank right you. Back at you. Thanks for joining us at The Preventable, brought to you ad-free by Prevent Ed. Prevent Ed works to reduce or prevent the harms of alcohol and other drug use through education, intervention, and advocacy. Please visit their website at prevented.org. Like what you heard? Rate, review, and subscribe to stay up to date with what we are serving on The Preventable.